Yes, thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about an island that's located in southern France where we had two invasive species, uh, the rat and copper brodus. And the effect of um, controlling these two species on ants, beetles, and spiders. So this, this island is located in the Mediterranean Sea in southern France. It's part of the national park of Porcro, and it's 58 hectares. It's been a wildlife sanctuary since 2007, so nobody is allowed to go on the island except scientists or managers. So the two species are the copper brodus, which is called also ice plant. It's a plant that covers the ground very much and produces a lot of litter and produces like, like really thick carpets and don't allow native species to grow with, with it. Uh, so it decreases a lot plant biodiversity at the local scale and microhabitats. The rat is an omnivorous species. It can eat plants, invertebrates, and small vertebrates. It's going to be eating um, whatever is available. So it can change its diet depending on what's available. And on this island, um, the rat was eating a lot of the copper brose fruits because there's no water on the island, no, no spring or anything, no, no small rivers. So the only source of water are plants. And they were eating a lot of the copper brose fruits called the copper brodus and leaves because they're really fleshy and full of water. And because of that, it's also helping the copper brodus to disperse because they eat the seed and they go poop somewhere else and that disperses the seeds, but that also increases germination of the seeds. So that's what's called an inv invasional meltdown, is when two invasive species are helping each other to increase their cover or spread. So the park decided to get rid of these two species on this island, um, and they started the eradication in 2011 and 2012. And after that, they put together a biocontrol where they go every year, sometimes several times a year, to check whether there's no more rats coming back and to check on the plants because, the, of course, the plants are coming back from the seed bank and germinating, so they pull the small germinations. In total, there was 40 <coughs> tons of copper burdens that was removed. Um, so you have the map with the cliff areas and inland sites that were more accessible, more easy to eradicate on these inland sites. Um, they pulled the live copper brodus and they also kind of removed or scraped the litter a little bit because the litter is really thick. And the longer the plant's been there, the thicker the litter can be. Then they captured two, about 2,000 rats with traps. And after capturing most of the population, then they put poison, bait, and they had left the bait until there was no more traces of consumption on the bait, no more traces of teeth and, and eating on the bait. And that was in June 2012. So what I'm going to show you now is the the monitoring we've been doing and the results from this monitoring. So there's monitoring before eradication. It's 2010 and 2011 and monitoring after eradication is 2015 and 17. We're still doing 2019, so I don't have the results yet. For each year, we have four sampling sessions of three weeks each. It's April, May, June, and September. April and May and June are spring and beginning of summer in France, so that's when the, the arthropods are very active. And September, they, they kind of like go are less active during the hot summer of August, and then they start again with the rain in September. So that's why we picked these three months to um, sample the, the beetles and ants and spiders. So we studied two areas, an area where the Caprobrotus was very thick uh, at the time it was there, and another area where the rat population was really dense. So that's the, the area where the, there was the denser amount of rats. In each of these areas, we placed one transect of 10 pitfall traps uh, spaced by five meters. And we studied all the, the, the arthropods that are in the, in the pitfall. And then we also had four uh, 100 meter square vegetation quadrats to look at the vegetation changes. 
for the analysis, we carried out uh, lots of analysis, but I'm going to show you just the multivariate analysis on species composition. So for the vegetation, there are a correspondence analysis on cover data. And for uh, the, the, the arthropods, there are non-metric um, multidimensional scaling and MDS, either on presence absence data or abundance data. Then I'm going to show you analysis of the beta taxonomic diversity between years. Um, so that's going to be um, represented with these little circles. Um, in the center, you have the dissimilarity, which is represented here in blue, but you'll see it won't be blue later. Uh, here it means that 34% of the composition of the assemblages are different between 2015 and 2017. So there's a 30% change in the assemblage between these two years. And 60% is the same. So 60% of the species are the same, right? And then the dissimilarity is divided between turnover and nestedness. Turnover is a change of species, a replacement of species, while nestedness is a nested loss or gain of species, depending on which way you go. Because if you, if the first year is here and the second year here, it can be sites too, right? It can be spatial or it can be between years. So if the first year is here and the second year is here, if you go this way, you lose species. But then it can be the opposite as well, where you gain species, right? Anyway, so it's a nested loss or gain of species. So let's look at the results in the Carpobrotus area to start with. In that area, the vegetation changed a lot. Of course, because we removed the Carpobrotus, that was pretty much the only species that was there. So before eradication, 2010, 2011, we pretty much only had Carpobrotus. All the pink and white flowers on these pictures are all Carpobrotus. So all of this is Carpobrotus. The native species are just the yellow one and the grayish ones here. So you have a few patches of the natives that were preserved. We try not to pull them when we pull the Carpobrotus. And um, so that's what it looked like before. And that, it looks nice on this picture because that's the two weeks where it's flowering. The rest of the time is really boring green. And then after eradication, the native vegetation came back pretty quick. I mean, it looks really nice uh, just you know, seven, uh, six years after uh, pulling the Carpobrotus. Um, we end up with an allophytic grassland with a lot of small camophytes. So you have grasses and herbs and small shrubs, all native, coming from the seed bank mostly. For the ants, you can see you have a difference between 2011 before eradication and 2017 after eradication. And this is mostly due to two species which are significantly increasing in occurrence uh, between the two years. It's Feridole paidula and Plagiolepis pygmea. Both species are xerophilus species that are more characteristic of dry grasslands. And it makes sense because the vegetation changed a lot towards the grasslands, so we have more xerophilus species. For the beetles, you can see also that the um, there are significant differences between 2010 and after eradication. You can also see that the, in 2010, the traps were very similar with each other, while 2015 and 17, they are more different because the vegetation is more heterogeneous. And of course, the beetles falling in the traps, it's, it's more heterogeneous as well. So we gain in heterogeneity. Um, so here you see comparing before and after, before and after in these two, there's about 60% difference between before and after on the species composition. And a lot of it is due to turnover, so species being replaced, but you also, we also have a gain of species with the nestedness here. So there's, there's new species coming in and some species being replaced. For the spider, it looks a little bit the same. You have 2010 on one side and the after eradication on the other side. About 60% differences in the years before, after, and before, after. So same kind of changes, about 60%. Here it's mostly due to turnover. So new species being, I mean, species being replaced. So some disappearing and some appearing. 
Among the species that are disappearing, um, that were abundant in 2010 and then disappear, or not disappear completely, but like they, their abundance decreases a lot, is Disdera and Ecobius. Both of these species, they like to be in moister environment, and the copper borders is a little, because of the fleshy leaves and the thick litter, makes it a bit more moist than the grassland area. Also, this dera is a, um, so you can see the, the litter on this, on this picture. It's one meter square full of Capoborus and litter. And this dera is also a species that's specialized in eating wood lice. So um, the wood lice is a, an animal that lives very much in the litter. So when there's a lot of litter, there's a lot of wood lice, and so there's a lot of these Disdera species. And you can see in, here in this graph, that's the abundance of the um, wood lice. With the time, eradication was around here, so there was a big decrease because we removed the, the litter when we pulled the Caprobrodus, we also removed the litter, so there's a big drop in the wood lice. So that kind of makes sense that the main predator of this uh, wood lice would, would go down as well. And then you have a little increase that might be due to the fact that 2015 was a really, really wet year, like at least uh, more than twice as much rain as usual. So maybe the plants grew more and there was more litter for, from the annual species and that's maybe why they came back. And then we had species that increased in this area. So Cephea and Aelurilus are two species that increased in the area, and they're characteristic of dry grasslands, so that kind of makes sense. So to conclude on the copper Brutus area, the vegetation is different before and after. Um, before, low plant diversity, few microhabitats, low landscape heterogeneity, few resources, because the flowers are just there for two weeks, and then the fruits are really hard. Um, and after you have higher plant diversity, many mm -hmm. microhabitats, many different kinds of litter, heterogeneity, and more resources because the flowering is more spread. So then you have the arthropods are following this pattern with differences between 2010 and after eradication, with ants and spider having more xerophilus species, typical of grassland, um, typical of grasslands. Um, and the spider and beetle, the spider is more turnover, and the beetle is part turnover and nestedness. Uh, part of the reason why some, some species are in common between before and after is because maybe of these patches of native vegetation where maybe there were some beetles there that remained with time because we didn't destroy this native vegetation when we pulled the copper borders. So some of the species are in common maybe because of this. What we can conclude for this area is that there's a very big bottom-up effect. Basically, it's the vegetation driving the ants, spiders, and beetles. Now let's look at what's going on in the rat area. So the vegetation didn't change in the rat area for all the years of the experiment. It's still a nitrophilous grassland. For the beetles, um, we can see some changes, but it's not really clear that it's going anywhere, and there's no clear difference between before and after. So there's differences between years, but no big, no big difference before and after. Most of it is due, most of the changes is due to turnover and you can see that the changes is much less than in the copper produce area. We had 60% changes and now it's only 30% changes. Same thing for the spider. There are changes in the composition. All the years are different, so there's no before and after thing like in the copper produce area. We can see that 2010 is one way and 2015 and then 2017 is in the middle kind of coming back. It's kind of weird. We don't really know what's going on. Most of it is due to nestedness, so species being gained or lost between years. And we didn't see any big increase or decrease in abundances of any species. The species where the abundance is varying the most, they don't have a unidirectional um, 
changes. They are increasing and then decreasing or decreasing and then increasing, right? So no clear pattern there. So to conclude on the radius area, uh, there's no changes over time for the vegetation. All the years for spiders and beetles are different. Um, and for the beetles, it's due to turnover, and for um, spiders, it's due to nest, nested nests, but there's no clear pattern of what's going on. What can be happening in that area is uh, it's a nitrophilous grassland where there's a lot of seagull nesting. Um, on top of being the area where there was the most strat, that's also the area on the island where there was the most seagull. And we didn't do anything to the seagull, but it, they just decreased kind of naturally because um, dumps where they used to feed have been forbidden. So it's not allowed to have open dumps anymore in Europe. Um, so they've been closing the dumps and the birds don't have access to trash anymore, but they, they feed a lot on trash. So basically they have to they have less resources for feeding, they have to feed in sea, and they probably don't bring as much, um, as much nutrients back to the island, and the population really decreased a lot. So there might be a bottom-up effect where there is less nutrient available on this island now for the, for the, for the arthropods, and so that might have um, uh, triggered some changes in the, in the assemblages. The other reason my, why it might be a little messy is because, so this area was the area where the density of rat was the highest. The rats, they eat the beetles, but they also eat the carprobrotus, as I said. Um, they eat potentially small birds and lizards, or at least they bother them, so they don't like to, the birds, they don't like to come to the island where there's a lot of rats because they're being bothered. So, um, These um, reptiles and birds are also feeding on the arthropods, right? When the rat has been removed from the area, then the population of reptiles and birds have, have increased. And that's, a, that's not a hypothesis. It, it's been followed. We've been following also birds and lizards. And the populations have really, really increased, which means that they might have increased their predation on the arthropods. Where well, you may say, before it was the rats, now it's the, the lizards eating the arthropods. Why are there so big changes? Well, the rat is a night animal, and the lizards and birds are day animals, so they might be predating on different things. So maybe that's why it's so messy in the data, and we can't see what's going on, because there might be some changes due, due to a shift of predation and then relationships between the arthropods. The one thing that's messing things up even more in this area is that the rats been back because they've been able to swim probably from the closest island to this island. So in 2015, they started detecting the rat again, and so they've been uh, putting a lot of bait to try to keep the population down. It was never back as high as it used to be, but the rat came back, and then in 2018, I think, we stopped seeing any traces of the rat. So it might have come back and then die. We don't really know what's going on with the rats. So anyways, this might also have been the reason why we have some increase and then decreases in, in some of the, of the spiders. So here that would be a top-down effect where the predators would be playing a role on the assemblages of, art, of arthropods. And that's it. So to conclude, the carpobotus area would be it's, it's very clear that it's a vegetation, the vegetation driving the assemblages, it's a bottom effect. While in the radius area, it's a little bit of a mess. There might be some effects of the seagull bringing the nutrients, bottom up effect. But it might also, might also be a predator shift and complicated things going on there that we don't, I can't tell you more <coughs> about that for, for now. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs>